Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. How is everyone here in Singapore? Yay, come on, it's early morning, get excited. It's going to be amazing. Um, so Marissa just put up my Twitter, um, sorry, my GitHub handle. So on the slides is my Twitter handle. So feel free to tweet, not just me, but all the speakers today. And I think our overall constellation um, hashtag is GH constellation. So hashtag that. Um, so yeah, and thanks for that awesome introduction. I'm super excited to talk to you all today. Now the title of my presentation is Technology Doesn't Equal Software. But I could have just as easily called this presentation Technology Doesn't Only Equal Software or Technology Isn't Just Software. Now who was here yesterday at the other GitHub conference? There's a few people in the room. Okay, so this is a very, very similar talk. I'm going to just throw a bit more into this one about how companies and corporates can get involved in working within the community as well. So if you have listened to my talk yesterday, apologies, and hopefully um, you find it just as exciting. So as Marissa said, I am known as the hackathon queen in Melbourne or in Australia, and that's because well, to date I've done over 53 hackathons now. And that's everything from running them to participating in them, judging and mentoring. And what I've done a lot more recently is work on corporate innovation and corporate hackathons. And that can be either when corporates run them internally or when corporates actually run them externally and get information back from the public. And I'll talk about that a little bit more in the presentation as well. As Marissa said, I'm a founder, so I've founded a few different companies. Um, but what I'm going to be talking a lot more today, a little bit about, is the Baja board, the off-road electric skateboard, which we will get to in a little bit, and I'm a brand ambassador for them. But to my talk first. So if you're here yesterday, you don't answer this, because you know the answers. But when I say technology, what do you all think about? And I want you to yell it out. I don't have amazing things to throw at you, but... You know, it's the morning, let's get excited. So if I say technology, what do you think about? Yep. Enabler. What else? Hardware. Mobile phones. What was that? Yep. What else? The rest of you don't think anything? When I want to say, pardon? Rocket. Amazing. So when I talk about or give this presentation, lots of people say, yeah, mobile phones and, um, you know, smart watches and AI and all those kind of things. I like it how you guys are thinking a little bit more outside the square about enabling and rockets and things like that. Because the definition of technology isn't what people always think it is. Now, when we say mobile phones and, um, you know, AI and those sort of things, they're talking about information technology. But technology isn't just that. So technology is actually the application of knowledge. Taking something and applying it, which is really, I like your answer. Um, and it can be not just science, but also the arts. And it can just be a process, invention, or a method. So if you come up with a new way for um, you know, designing tablecloths, that is technically speaking technology. You've come up with something new. You've changed the process of how something was done. Now, an example of this is back in the day, this was considered technology, a pen and paper, because this was new from what they had previously. Previously, you had stone tablets and you wrote on papyrus and things like that, whereas this was considered technology. Now, the premise for this talk came from one of my good friends. This, his name is Kettle, or as you pronounce it in, um, in Norwich, is um, Shetul. So <laughs> that's an interesting one. But he makes this. Does anyone know what it is? Bacon season. You were at my talk yesterday, were you? <laughs> so it is a vegetarian bacon seasoning. Now, this guy loves bacon, so he thought, you know, oh, you know bacon's pretty bad for you. I'm going to come up with a, a, um, you know, a flavoring or a seasoning that makes um, everything taste like bacon without all the bad um, things that bacon can give you. Now, this guy presented at some startup um, pitch competitions in Australia, and the panel of judges said to him, I really like your idea, I think it's great, but I don't think you'll make any money from it and you won't get any money from us as investors because you don't use technology and you're not a startup. And he went, 
Well, actually, the amount of food technology that goes into creating a product like this is astronomical. Not only that, this guy has one of the number one e-commerce websites in Australia. His conversion rate of people going onto the website and buying something is ridiculously high. So you can't tell me that that's not technology. And I thought, all right, I'm going to do a really quick brainstorm. And I looked at the startups in Melbourne. So this is just in Melbourne. And in about 20 or 30 seconds, I wrote down a list of startups that do physical products. So there's companies on here. So Quadlock, I don't know if you guys have Quadlock here. I know they're about in five or six different countries around the world. But it's a um, phone case, and you can clip it onto your arm or your bike or your car, which is pretty awesome. Mimi Tech do robot chickens for helping um, chicks while they're, while they're growing. Brosa does furniture. We've got Relectrify who do batteries. We've got Pallet there, which is this little cube and you scan, and it gives you every color combination of that um, color that you scan. Who's heard of zero latency? The people in my talk would have yesterday. Who else? Anyone else? Now, this is really cool. I was walking around the shops yesterday in Singapore, and I saw a sign for Zero Latency. So Zero Latency is a company in Melbourne that are now all over the world, and you have one here in Singapore. So they use virtual reality, and you go into a, you know, a real building, put on the virtual reality headset, and you run around in the building shooting zombies with your teammates. Um, if you haven't done it, Highly recommend, and if you don't like zombies, I have a couple other games you can do as well. So all these companies here, while they make physical products, they're all underpinned by software and technology. Either technology because it's a hardware type technology, you know, how many times have you bought um, like clothing and they're like, oh, it's, it's microfiber wicking technology. You're like, ooh, I'm gonna buy that because it's got the word technology in it. Um, and if they're not underpinned by a specific type of IT technology, they all use software to drive their systems. Either they have an e-commerce website or they use software to talk to their hardware. So saying that, coding and software is everywhere around us. Who's got a mobile phone? Everyone? Every, every single person's hand should be up. Who's got a smartwatch? A few people got smartwatches? Yeah, so again, we understand this, but physical hardware uses software to talk to us and tell us things. This happens in a lot of other areas as well. So who's heard of Tesla? Again, everyone's hands should be pretty much up. So even on Tesla's website, they call this car a computer. Now, a few years ago, we probably wouldn't have called cars technology or we wouldn't um, view them as the type of technology that we view them as today. But cars that use electrical technology are all underpinned by some sort of software that drives them. Now, who's been in a Tesla? I actually want to see hands up for this one. I'm right up. We've got two people in the room have been in Tesla. Have you done the insane mode on it? No? Have you done insane mode? You've seen it. You haven't done it. So when you go on insane mode, you jump in the car and it literally launches you off and you like sit back in your chair and it's pretty nuts. That is controlled by software that drives that. If software didn't control this car, it would be way too powerful. So the battery technology in these types of cars is so powerful that if you let the motor do what it wants to do, it will literally just take off on you. The software has to reduce the amount of power output from the batteries that go into the motor so you can safely either drive or sit in the car while somebody drives it for you. Now this is very similar to what, what um, I worked on a little bit with a company, so I'm an ambassador with them at the moment, but I used to work full time with these guys and they make off-road electric skateboards. So when I was walking around Singapore yesterday, I saw some electric skateboards, I saw a lot of electric scooters. These ones are sort of similar but they're like an off-road version. And I'm really glad Singaporeans work in um, kilometres per hour because it, I don't know the miles, miles on this thing, but it's 60 kilometres per hour is the top speed on this. So it's pretty high. It can go from zero to 30 in about two seconds. And this thing has enough power to tow a car. 
and this is all driven by software. Now, we've got a cool little video just to show you what it does and what it can do. Um, the guys put this together, we have a little bit of sound, that would be great. So Baja 1000 is an extreme off-road rally over in California. Um, it can go up a 60% gradient if you get a standing start. So you can tackle pretty much any hill or mountain that you set your mind to. There it is going 56. It went up a bit high. This is the guys that went over to China and did a tour around China. Riding in the outback in Australia is easy and fun. We even decided to do it on the snow. So put some snow tires on there and go off and ride in the snow. These are the guys down at the BMX track, so you can do like drift mode and burnout mode. Again, towing a car, so it's a small car, but it's still a car. That's me on a um, boogie board, that's me riding again. I don't know why they put videos of me in this. There's me again, just riding along the beach. Um, so as the guys say, it's not um, necessarily a skateboard because it's so high powered compared to all the skateboards that are out there at the moment. Um, but it's a lot of fun. A few people yesterday said, oh, where, where can I ride one of these things? Um, and I said, you know, if you come to Melbourne or Sydney, I can, I can totally get you a ride. So if you come to Australia, hit me up. So as I mentioned, it has a drift mode on it. So you can put it into drift and then you can go around doing like donuts in the sand. It's got a burnout mode on it. So you can, you know, throw up heaps of sand and impress all your mates. But one of the coolest things about the board is the control system. So that thing hanging off my arm there is the remote hand controller. And this controller does a range of different things that we've programmed into it. So you can change the power. So if you get on it for the first time, you don't want to go 60 k's an hour, you can cap off the speed. So you can go 5, 10, 20, as much as you like. You can also change the launch on it. So if you're not so confident of standing on a board and getting launched off, you know, zero to 30 in about two seconds, you can change that. And you can also change the traction control and braking. This is all done through the programming of the board and the controllers that we've done. So every single board that we make has to be programmed and spec'd. So we spec all the batteries ourselves and then inside our boards is a little PCB. Now that PCB is programmed to work with the controller. So when you use a controller and you tell the controller to do something, it sends a remote signal to the PCB in the, inside our board. That PCB then sends a signal to the battery to tell the battery how much power to output from the battery to the motor controllers to the wheels. So you can then drive the board. Now one of the cool, who's an engineer in the room? Any engineers? A couple. So when I say this has got electronic um, differentiation in it, that is pretty cool. So because we've got four independent wheels, when you talk to the, um, the PCB, it can tell the battery to output as much power as you want to each particular motor, which is how we can do the burnout mode and the drift mode on the board. Now, as I mentioned, the boards are programmed, so that's one part of software. But say if this board didn't have any software inside it, it was just a normal skateboard that didn't have any power. Software is highly critical to actually making the board parts itself. So every single part on our board needs to be made exactly to the right specifications. Every single little hole there has to have the exact tolerance so that the screws can go through it without breaking the part. Now the only way this is possible is by getting a machine to print these parts for us. And when I say print, I'm talking about CNC milling, so not 3D printing, I'm CNC routing. And all the software that we send to the machines uh, prints the parts or uh, routes the parts out so that every single piece is exactly the same. It's all driven by software. And this is, if we didn't have anything else, again, we need a website to sell our product. So this is where GitHub comes in for us. So I was able to do a bunch of really cool things in our website with GitHub. I created this cool little, I don't have a little GIF of it, but I created this cool little 360 degree model so you could pick up the board with your mouse and swing it around. Um, that was pretty exciting. And from this little collaboration that we had with GitHub, Sam, who's not in the room, who's the director of APAC, he's a semi-pro skateboarder and he saw 
and what we're doing is GitHub, and he saw the board, and he had to go, and he's like, okay, we need to get one of these. So we decided to work with Sam and the team, and we created this really cool little GitHub branded board. Um, I don't usually ride around in a Santa Claus costume. This was um, our Christmas e-skate ride last year. Now, what I really liked about this project was we're taking something that was very like digital, so like, GitHub's very like digital, and putting it in like a physical product to say, you know, this is our board that we created that we're able to drive because we, our software is hosted on places like GitHub. So it was really, really exciting to work with the team there. Now, this brings me to the second part of my presentation, and that's working together. So by us as Baja Board working with some amazing companies like GitHub, we can achieve some really awesome things. And I think it's really important to think about the communities that we live in. We don't live in a, in a place or a community where it's just our own company or our own industry. Therefore, for us to get things done and for us to move forward as an industry, as a company, as a community, as a country, we need to work together to do those. Now, again, as um, Maurice mentioned, I'm from Australia, so I'm taking a lot of these learnings from Australia. Um, so I'm not too sure exactly what the landscape is like here in Singapore, but this is what I've identified in Australia. So through the different work that I do as a founder, as a ambassador with different companies, um, and also working within uh, university in the corporate environment, I've identified three main sectors within our community. And that is the startups and not-for-profit organisations, the um, universities and government, and the industry and corporates. And what I've really noticed is that these three different key areas all operate almost exclusively on their own. Um, it's becoming a lot better now. I mean, if a couple of years ago that like, I could talk to one, they wouldn't even know what the other ones um, are doing. But they all play in a separate area. And what's really important to note about these sectors is that they all have different things that they can offer one another. For example, your startups and community groups are small teams, so they're very agile. They often bring new ways of thinking. The university groups are massive hubs of research through their PhD projects and their research projects. They also are big wealth of knowledge and future resources as they're training the next generation of workers. Governments are able to make real changes and driven through policy and reviews. And on the other hand, you've got your industry and your corporates who more often than not have the resources the money and the expertise, and also the corporate partnerships to be able to execute big products and big projects. So what I sort of do in the work that I um, do in a day-to-day -day work is I kind of sit in this kind of middle bit here. And so I've seen each one working almost exclusively, but I kind of sit in the middle and I go, hang on, you guys are doing something over here that those guys over there are doing, why don't you talk together? And a lot of people always ask me, like, oh, you know, it's great, um, you know, we're an industry or a corporate, um, and we have these fantastic things that we're working on, and some of our processes or our policies for the year going forward are to be more innovative and work with startups. And I, the one question I get asked all the time is, how do we actually do that? So there's a few different things you can do. As I mentioned, I run a lot of hackathons, and that's probably one of the easiest ways to start innovation, start working within these groups. So big companies in Australia, like it's Telstra and um, you know, the big energy companies, universities, they run hackathons and they get in people from all the sectors. They get in students, they get in university teachers and workers, they get in people working in the industry, they get in startups, entrepreneurs, founders, tech people, business people, they get them all in one room working together. So that's the first thing, getting people in a room working together. Another way these companies can, and um, groups can work together is working together on projects. Projects are a great way to bring in different aspects and different people to do something. And I'll talk about a few of these projects as well. 
So one of the things we were able to do is um, Baja Borders. And I'm really excited. Singapore has a Grand Prix as well. I'm going to go check out the track later. But in Australia, we have the, um, the Melbourne Grand Prix at Albert Park. And this was us last year. So as Baja Board, we were able to go to the Grand Prix because the University of or RMIT University hosted this innovation precinct. University of Melbourne supported us in going and the Grand Prix actually got on board and helped us to do uh, workshops and helped us to showcase our product and our um, company to a bunch of students and people who came through throughout the week. This guy who's sitting in the middle runs his own um, tech journal in the UK. So by us all working together, we're able to bring him out uh, to Australia. He's kind of already coming anyway, but we were able to get in touch with him and get him on a panel talking with some of our engineers and teaching students. So that was a really, really good collaboration that was only possible because each people from the different sectors came together and worked together. Another example of this was Superu in Melbourne. I went to them and said, hey guys, you kind of have a very similar kind of company uh, vision as us. So Subaru is very off-roady, extreme. They get the young generation go out on an adventure, very much what our boards do. So I went, I approached them and I said, since we have this very similar vision, why don't we work together on something? And they said, oh, that's a great idea. We've got a new car coming out soon, so why don't we have a launch day for the car? You can bring your boards out. And I was like, that's pretty cool. So in Melbourne, they have an off-road track. So we bought in our boards and we had the cars there and you could ride our board around the off-road track. Then half an hour later, you could jump in a car and go for a drive in the car. So this was a really good collaboration that people could come from the community and see what we we're doing. So if we are able to bring these three sectors together and they work together in harmony, we get what happens in the middle. Real changes are able to be made. I was talking to some guys yesterday and we were talking about one of the benefits of hackathons being not just focused on tech people. So if you run a hackathon and you bring 50 tech people or 50 developers and you put them all in one room like this, and all those developers came from the same company or same type of company, they had a very similar company culture, they all came, or they all grew up in the same place. They went to a very similar type of school and they had the same sort of upbringing. They are probably going to come up with, if you pose a challenge to them, they're probably going to come up with 50 very similar ideas, right? Because they all have the same experience and expertise. So what we want to do is we want to bring in different mixes of people into the room. And that video that you saw at the very start talking about um, you know, women of colour and women and different people working in the tech industry, it's all about bringing diversity into the play, right? So by bringing in people with diverse opinions and experiences, you get real change happening. Now, I spoke about this one yesterday, so I'm a little bit low on time, so I'll leave this um, example. You can come and chat to me a little bit later about this. This was a startup in Melbourne who worked with um, the city of Melbourne to do some amazing things around Christmas time. So I wanted to end on a couple of little quotes, and this is one of my favourites from Helen Keller, and that's that only by working together can we actually get things done. We can create some amazing things when we all work together. Now, bringing it back to the start of my talk, I talked about technology not just being about software or not just being about the type of IT tech that we see today, but being about something much more. And the final quote I wanted to end on was by one of my favourite authors. And he talks about that making the process better, easy and cheap is an important aspiration and something we continually work on. We should all work on this together. But he said it is not the goal. Making something great is the goal, and making something great together is what our goal should be. Now, that was Ed Catmull from the founder of Pixar, and he wrote this in an amazing book, Creativity Inc., in which I highly encourage you to all go see. So today, 
I don't have time for questions, but if you want to come and chat to me, I'm around all day. Today, I want you to go back to your companies, your groups, your organizations, and think about how you want to work together with people in your community, because only then can you actually make a big change. Thanks very much for listening to me, and I'll be around all afternoon.